Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for blowing in tonight. Very happy to have you here. Sometime way in the past, uh, a member of the organizing committee must have been, been from Switzerland because we, we, like Swiss trains, we always believe in starting on time. I don't know why, but we do. So we are. Uh, it's my pleasure as a member of the uh, organizing committee or steering committee to welcome you tonight. I am uh, David Forsyth and this is the 32nd, 32, 32nd annual winter lecture series. And this year, as uh, I think everybody knows, the focus is on nationalism and uh, national identity and what this means for uh, world affairs and world order. This uh, series is sponsored by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church, Humanities Nebraska, the uh, Author Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, which uh, come together. And if we ask you to be sure and sign in and put your name on the list, it's because when we go to uh, the Humanities Group next year uh, with our annual request for money, We'd like to be able to show how many people we have reached in the uh, preceding year. So if you haven't signed in, please do that. Um, please also silence your electronic devices. And as they say at the LEAD Center, do not use this time to update your Facebook page. Uh, you can tell where I borrowed that uh, land from. Uh, as many of you know, we give the first hour to the speaker. We then take a 15-minute break, and then we come back for discussion and questions and answer. Um, you will find free refreshments during the break, but there will be some baskets out there if you should like to drop in a donation. That would be much appreciated, and that goes into the funding for uh, the series next year. Uh, if you are currently getting information about the series in hard copy, it would help us to switch to electronic. So the key email address is R-D-I-E-N, as in uh, Dean Spear, R-D-I-E-N, at nebraska.rr.com. Uh, I should also like to point out that if you would like to see the videos of this lecture and the preceding lectures, the easiest way is just to go to Google and Google in, type in and under Google, Winter Lecture Series. Go to Google, just type in Winter Lecture Series, and of the 4,000 options that come up, among the top three or four, you will see the right one for the Unitarian Church. That's the easiest way to uh, review uh, what you've heard or see the ones that you have missed. Um, I've been asked to note that uh, it's a little strange since it's about 70 degrees outside, if bad weather ever seems to threaten. Um, the future, like, and it could happen of course in this state, we've got uh, one more speaker and then a final wrap-up panel and it could be snowing by then. So um, if you're in doubt about whether the lecture series is going to be held on that Sunday evening, go to the Unitarian Church website and an announcement will be posted there, uh, www.unitarianlincoln.org, or again, Google Unitarian Church and pull it up. And if ever you cannot find parking in the parking lot immediately in front of the church, uh, it is permissible to use the parking lot in the high school across the street. Um, I think that is the laundry list that I was asked to cover, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce the speaker tonight. Uh, Mahmoud uh, Manshapuri uh, is from Iran. He took his early education in Iran. After the 1979 revolution, he came to the United States and completed his PhD at the University of Georgia. <coughs> After that, he taught in several schools in, uh, I believe it was Michigan and also Connecticut, and currently he is Professor of International Relations at San Francisco State University, where he will, he's in line to be the next uh, department chair there, and he also teaches at 
Cal Berkeley. He's a very well-known scholar of Middle East affairs. He has ten books out there if you want to, again, Google him and look him up. Uh, one of them with Paul Gray Publishers is on, and I'm not giving you the exact title, but it's basically on Muslim identity and the resulting activity in world affairs. So he is dead on about our topic in this winter lecture series, and tonight, as you can see, it's about uh, nationalism in the Middle East. And he's very well qualified to talk about uh, Iran and also the Arab world, about Syria, about Iraq, uh, about the various developments. And so we're very happy that he has taken time from uh, teaching both at San Francisco State and also at Cal Berkeley to carve out this weekend uh, to spend with us. And with that, Mahmoud. David for the kind words. Uh, I stand before you deeply humbled in the presence of a scholar who has published more than 30,000 books. <laughs> I would say 30,000 but I meant to say 30 but uh, when he mentioned I published 10 books I, am, I feel deeply humbled. So uh, uh, I feel greatly honored to uh, uh, have been able to appear before you. This is my second time I loved it so much the first time that uh, David, uh, when he uh, graciously contacted me, and I said, I'll be delighted to actually come and, and participate. I had such a wonderful experience. So I'm very happy to be, uh, to be with you. Uh, uh, we're going to have a, a discussion till uh, 8 o'clock. And then uh, one thing I can assure you, the Q&A would be much more exciting than the actual lecture. Because I know you have a lot of questions. And, uh, and uh, I feel uh, really uh, uh, honored to be here and see if I can actually answer some of the questions that you have here. Uh, the topic of nationalism, it's such a broad topic that I thought perhaps one way to handle that is to just focus on the national identities and then break it down into some notion of nationalism and then we can actually take it from there. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to start by explaining for you uh, the, the ways that people can think about national identity. Uh, historically, national identity was known to be uh, sort of a uh, primordial type of identity, that there wasn't much of a sort of civil connection and therefore people went to their primordial communal ties. Uh, and then over time we saw a different version of national identity which is known as sort of a modernist version. And that version appeared with the emergence of nation-state and the fusion of the state and the society. That, that the modernist version of nationalism uh, became pretty much embedded in the relationship between the individual and the state. And we saw a reaction to that in the form of what is also can be dubbed as a uh, anti-modern trajectory. That is to say that we saw a degree of going back to the communal, the old way of doing things and there's this tendency that people always looked at the past as glorious years. And so anytime they wanted to resist the state, they wanted to show some <coughs> resistance towards the state, they felt that they have to go back to the glory years of the past. And this is what we see today in the attempt of a state or pseudo a state called ISIS, Islamic State, in uh, Iraq and, and uh, in Syria, that we'll be talking about that uh, a lot in the course of this presentation. But 
why is that, why is that nationalism or national identity has not been a good fit in Middle East? Why is that national identity is not a concept that sometimes fits in or dovetails nicely within the cultural uh, identical sort of a, uh, context of the Middle East? Why is that that concept is not a good fit? In large part because that there are so many different competing identities in the Middle East that the notion of nationalism is having a hard time to kind of adjust itself into that different environment. And, and in order for us to understand what happened in the Middle East that we are seeing now a backlash against nationalism, so if you got to go back to 1916, exactly a century ago. Uh, in 1916, French and British, they decided to uh, work with Arabs within the Ottoman Empire to cause the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire. And in order to do that, they came up with a strategy of galvanizing Arab nationalism. So they felt like if they can galvanize Arab nationalism, they can create cracks within the Ottoman Empire, and that way they can cause the crumbling, of, uh, the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire. So they decided actually to divide the land and redraw the borders. But when they decided to do that, it wasn't consistent with the notion of indigenous nationalism. They divided the land in order to uh, suit their particular geopolitical and strategic interest. So they divided the land, but not in a way that is consistent with the cultural, religious, ethnic, sectarian identities, but rather uh, in a way that it suits its own strategic goals. So let me just uh, stay on the narrative of the so-called sykes pico agreement and I explain for you the details of that and then we can see why nationalism has become a, a, a sort of a point of resistance. Uh, Mark Sykes, you see his pictures on the, on the upper left, uh, represented Great Britain, uh, entered into secret negotiations with uh, uh, Pico, you see the picture on the right side, sykes pico agreement between the British and French Secretary of State, this agreement was secret. Nobody knew of that. And initially, uh, the, uh, the, the Russians also were involved in that. But there was a Bolshevik revolution a year after that. And so the British and French excluded uh, the, uh, the Russians or the Soviets at the time. They excluded them. And as a result, uh, they uh, published in some uh, newspaper in Russia, they publish uh, the details about this, uh, this secret meetings. Up until 1917, nobody knew that there was a secret agreement between French and British. It was revealed in some newspaper in Russia that, uh, uh, that there is such a secret deal between them because they were excluded because of the Bolshevik Revolution. But anyway, so what happened is that uh, the, the, uh, these two foreign uh, ministers they got together and they worked a secret deal to divide the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Exactly at the same time, they worked a separate, British worked a separate deal with the Arabs through some kind of correspondence that came to be known as McMahon Hussein correspondence. Hussein, Sharif of Mecca Hussein, was the most notable person in the Arabian Peninsula and McMahon was representing Great Britain. They uh, actually worked through uh, uh, 10, 13 letters of correspondence. At the time, there wasn't any email, so they had to actually, <laughs> actually get together and, and, and uh, correspond uh, that way. So during this correspondence, it became very clear to uh, the Arabs' uh, end of this bargain that if they cooperate with British to go after the Ottomans, and then the, the, the British made the pledge, that once those lands are liberated, they can give them back to the Arabs. The Arabs have the incentive to work with the Arab Muslims, to work with the Christian West, 
to militate against the Muslim Ottoman Empire. So their interest was basically geostrategic. You know, they worked with the Christian West to get rid of a, an, a, an empire that they were under. That empire happened to be a Muslim empire. And so I want you to pay attention to the sequence of the years. 1916, British are working across purposes. They are, on the one hand, they're working with French and they're giving them the promise of the division of the uh, uh, land when the Ottomans are defeated. But at the same time, they're saying to the Arabs, once we defeat Ottoman Empire, the land, you, you get your lands back. And those actually achieve those goals. They are not consistent, they are not compatible. If anything else, they are actually opposite in the end of this, this bargaining situation. But a year after that, adding more insult to the injury, a year after that, in a very famous, a very famous declaration called Balfour Declaration, uh, the James Arthur uh, Balfour came out and said, the British government is looking favorably at the creation of a homeland for Jews in Palestine. And then added that this should not be achieved to the detriment of the Palestinian local people and all these things. So when you look at 1916 and 1917 and look at the sequence of these things, what the British are doing, British are galvanizing the Arab nationalism but they are also galvanizing and, and the Jewish nationalism. And these two will come to a head in a place called Palestine. That's the place that they cannot be reconciled. And hence, the beginning of the tensions into war period, and then the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, and then four wars, and the rest of the story, uh, you know, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that has been going on for a very long time. This is the way Sykes people agreement actually uh, started in 1916, but it was implemented after WW1 by 1919. Uh, uh, so the decision was made uh, uh, that uh, French will receive Syria, the greatest Syria that included Lebanon. And uh, the British wanted to have access to India, but the, they were very keen on uh, Jordan. Iraq and Palestine, largely they wanted to make sure that they have the control of the Palestine and Iraq, and in Iraq they wanted the northern part of Iraq where the Kurdish population was there because they wanted to make sure that it is to the northern part of Iraq that they can actually connect to India because for them the, 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 the biggest prize in a strategic radar that they had was India. So they wanted to make sure that they have access to India. So that was the bargain, that French would receive the Syria and Lebanon and British will have uh, Palestine and Iraq. And if you look at the map, they have, you know, actually they have zones, some zones directly under their control, other zones they drew the map in such a way that they, they give the local people some degree, limited degree of autonomy, but certain areas would put uh, directly under their influence. So that's the way they actually divided uh, the, uh, the, the Middle East. So now, they have the interwar period, uh, they have the wave of the Jews are coming to Palestine. Uh, some of the Palestinians are selling the lands to the Jews, and some of the Palestinians who are the landowners are absentee landowners. They lived in Cairo, they lived in uh, Damascus, they lived in Beirut. And so the Jews will come in wave after waves and they buy the land, and then, of course, the Hitler situation, the Holocaust, you have more uh, migration of the Jews in. In the area, the population actually of the Jews is, is increasing at this time. So, in the, in the post WW, uh, 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 the Second World War, WW2, you have the emergence of a sense of uh, nationalism that, in both application and form, uh, it varies from the different type of uh, nationalism that we have seen uh, in, say, in Europe. In terms of application, uh, na nationalism is kind of problematic because it doesn't fit the local context. And I'm using the word MENA, meaning Middle East, North Africa. Uh, the, it's problematic in the case of uh, MENA because you have different sort of competing identities along the lines of religion, sectarian, ethnic, and tribal, and all those things. But 
there are three forms of nationalism that one can look at those forms and say that there are a type of nationalism that is first and foremost directed against colonial powers. And so nationalism in that part of the world was uh, more in line and in, in uh, alliance with resistance toward uh, colonial power. The first form of nationalism was religious nationalism. And it started in Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna creating a party called the Muslim Brotherhood. Exactly in the same decade we had the rise of secular nationalism in Turkey under uh, uh, Ataturk, in Iran under Reza Shah, in Turkey 1923. Ataturk created the uh, uh, secular uh, modernizing Turkey and, and in Iran Reza Shah in 1925 created the Pahlavi dynasty. Both of them. So if you look at 1920s, this is the decade of both religious nationalism and secular nationalism. People look at Egypt today and feel like Egyptian people are kind of sandwiched between two uh, democratic forces of the military and, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And they look at it like as if this is sort of a modern phenomenon. It is not. Actually, the roots of that can be go back to 1920s when you had this, this different type of uh, nationalism. The third form of nationalism is the one that I want to talk about tonight. And I want to actually focus on that a lot. And that, that is the form that is called religious universalism. Religious universalism is a challenge to uh, nationalism. In the sense that uh, it is interested in the creation of a nation state which is very homogeneous. That's what the ISIS wants. They want to create a nation state in which uh, uh, Sunnis are running the show and uh, they are not going to accept uh, uh, Shia and uh, I don't know whether they have room for Christian or Jews but they want to create a very homogeneous and their message is the message of a religious universalism and there's this argument that compared to the nation states despite the fact that nation states have all kind of handicaps, shortcomings uh, the shortcomings of the nation state pale considerably by comparison with the atrocities that have been uh, committed in the name of religious universalism so if you want to talk about that uh, in much more detail, I want to open up the can of work for you, which is ISIS, and we want to talk about that. Let me talk about the changing identities, <laughs> and then we come back to the, uh, the ISIS issue. Under the Ottoman Empire, the dominant identity form was communal. <laughs> Different communities were uh, somewhat autonomous. Uh, as long as you pay your taxes to the Pasha, Pasha was representing the Ottoman Empire. And the Pasha will leave you actually alone, and you can go to uh, synagogue, you can go to church, you can go to mosque. The only thing that you have to do, you have to pay your taxes. <coughs> and you were living in a sort of multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies, and you were pretty much autonomous. The dominant form of identity was communal. <coughs> but then came the post-Ottoman era and the, uh, the, uh, the, the post-war period. Uh, some of these countries moved towards secular nationalism. And also with that we saw the emergence of uh, religious uh, nationalism. But two important developments pushed religious nationalism, which started back in the 1920s as sort of a school of thought or something, uh, two important developments pushed religious nationalism to the forefront of global politics and regional politics. One was the 1967 Arab-Israeli war, which was absolutely categorically humiliating to the Arabs. People ask me that exactly when is the beginning of the religious nationalism, not as a sort of a school of thought that Hassan al-Banlaw created in 1928, but, but as a matter of really concrete, kinetic, and, and, and very, very important uh, politics. And the beginning of the religious nationalism 
was when the secular Arab countries were defeated so bad in 1967. The second development that pushed uh, religious nationalism to the forefront of the regional international politics was the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which toppled a secularized, modernizing uh, regime of the Shah of Iran, and a theocratic regime replaced monarchy. These two developments push religious nationalism to the forefront of regional politics, and somehow they became major development. Uh, let me just provide you by way of giving you different perspectives. That people are looking at the rise of religious nationalism and they're asking what happened to the secular nationalism. There are many different views and I'm going to provide you those views and you be the judge. I don't mean actually to impose uh, any of these views on you, but I would just want to give you a, a, a taste of the different arguments in the field. Uh, the first point of uh, debate about this emergence of this new identity is uh, coming uh, uh, from uh, Christopher Hills, uh, who argues that the dissolution of the Arab order was facilitated, or if you will, made possible by the 2011 Arab Springs. Because these Arab uprisings uh, in Middle East, uh, they created a vacuum in which the old uh, monarchs and uh, secular authoritarian regimes uh, they, 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 uh, they appear not to be capable of the, you know, meeting the demands of this respite population and they felt kind of impotent and they felt like they had a ruling bargain with their people and that bargain was totally broken the ruling bargain was that I take care of your security I will give you security and the other end of the bargain is that you don't challenge my political uh, system. I don't want you to actually go in the street and protest and ask for individual rights, civil rights, and all these things. But uh, in an Hobbesian way, I'll give you order and security, and so you should be very thankful for that, and, and you should not ask for anything. This was the ruling bargain. Arab Spring actually broke that ruling bargain, ended that ruling bargain. People went to the street, and they said, not only do you want bread, but we want also freedom, and you know what? We want social justice. In Egypt, the three most important words on the banner that you can see all over the Egypt was Aish, bread, Horia, freedom, and Adalat Ijtamai, social justice. There was nothing religious about the message of the young people in Egypt. Predominantly secular demands. Kind of remind me of the Occupy uh, Oakland or Wall Street and all these things. And the message are purely secular and the motivations are secular and there's nothing really religious about those demands. Uh, another perspective is coming from uh, uh, Raja uh, Shahada and Penny Johnson who argue that history is going backwards in the Middle East. And if we want to know why history is going backward, it, that in order to understand this reversion, we have to understand the way the sox pico agreement created you know, different parts in the Middle East and people actually responding to those differences. Uh, one other point of view is coming from uh, Richard Haas, who argues that the Arab world today is where Europe was in, uh, uh, I don't know, mid, early or late 17th century. And, and uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, tremendous, you know, lengthy, prolonged wars that uh, uh, engulfed the Central Europe, and it was a very difficult uh, uh, time, and at the end of that, there was some kind of agreement. And so one of the points that Haas makes is that, that, that whereas the U European continent, somehow, after 30 years of war, uh, they evolved into resolving these problems through some kind of, uh, I don't know, I mean, they had diplomatic ways of resolving the problems. In some cases, it really took an interwar, you know, interstate war. Diplomacy, sovereignty, rules of law, international law, they were able to kind of evolve out of those difficult times. Uh, in contrast, he argues that the Middle East has descended into a, a sectarian war. And uh, this uh, bodes ill for the future of the region. And it could mean the beginning of 30 years of war that the Muslim world is going to 
experience. So that's, that's another perspective. Uh, to give you a sort of an absolutely different uh, way of understanding the development, I'm going to give you a, 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 a bring to you a quotation from uh, uh, Samir, Amin, uh, Samir Amin, who says the United States has adopted actually a, a policy of promoting militant political Islam, because any, any time they see a radical movement, secular movement, pro-human rights movement, pro-democratic movements, they actually go and feed uh, the uh, radical Islamists, so that way they can counterbalance the emergence of the democratic movement. This is sort of a skeptic point of view, but you know, guess what? This point of view sells very well in Middle East. Uh, people on the street level can actually identify with that way of thinking. And, and speaking of the perception, this is a very, very strong sort of perception on the street level. That, yes, we do have radicals, we have extremists, but is also this extreme is also supportive and, 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 and uh, espoused behind the scenes by the, by the outside powers because they have an interest in disrupting democratic process, uh, especially after the Arab Spring. The degree of negativity among uh, the, the, the sort of youth in the street, on the streets of Egypt and uh, Tunisia, kind of relates that mes this message to us that that perception is very strong. But let me just get back to ISIS. I know uh, 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 a number of you are interested in knowing about the ISIS. Uh, ISIS is locally known as Daesh. So I'm going to use the word Daesh, and so uh, so that uh, we replace the, the term uh, you know, ISIS here. Uh, ISIS was created uh, in large part because of the U.S. invasion of uh, Iraq in, on, on March 19, 2003. Prior to March 2003, there wasn't any ISIS group or any organization of that name in Iraq. Uh, what happened is that a lot of Arabs were put in the uh, uh, a prison known as, uh, I think, Bukha prison. Uh, a lot of these radicals in that prison, uh, they, they came into contact with one another, they, they kind of forged some, so, so, some kind of networking. And a number of the, uh, the leaders of the ISIS later on, they are the ones who actually served in that prison in Iraq after the Iraq was occupied by the Americans. And, and so by 2006, something was created called, I don't know, a shadow organization, whatever it was, it was called Islamic State in Iraq, ISI. But it was not called ISIS, it was ISI, Islamic State in Iraq. And so this group started to kind of uh, distinguish itself from Al-Qaeda. There was an Al-Qaeda in Iraq by then, and they uh, have a different approach to uh, uh, making their presence felt on the political scene. So they part companies with Al-Qaeda, and they started actually penetrating in other areas, and they had a plan, they have a strategy, they work on the tactics and all these things. But then it took a while before uh, they expand the domains of operations. And they were looking for an opportunity to uh, penetrate into Syria. But the opportunity was not there because there wasn't any, anything there for them to actually penetrate. But then the opportunity was presented to them. Uh, when Arab Spring happened and Syria, uh, the wave of the Arab Spring not the door of Syria. And, and that's where ISI became ISIS. It, was, it became the Islamic State of Iraq and Shams, or Iraq and Syria, or Daesh. It became Daesh when actually it went into Syria. So there, are no, uh, there is, there's no question that when you look at the genesis of ISIS, People say 2004, people say 2006, and then it's the Arab Spring that really provides them the opportunity to go in sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, destabilized situation of Syria. That was a perfect opportunity for them, perfect moment for them to uh, expand their organization. Uh, the rise of 
sub-national, sub-regional, transnational identities, especially in a fragile state. If there are two states in the Middle East, that you have a very tentative, very tenuous relationship between the state and the local national identities are exactly these two states. The Arab Spring, which is worth looking at it in terms of the aftershocks of that, one of the slides I'm going to show that, was the opportunity to show that tenuous relationship between the state and the nationals and the local national identities. And so we're going to come back to that and talk about it. Uh, the rise of the heavy armed militia was another reason for some of these local uh, identities to pop up to question and challenge the national identities. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict certainly didn't help. And uh, the sectarian tensions that we'll be talking about it and violence that much. Let me talk about the aftershocks of the Arab Spring. Look, Arab Spring touched six countries in the Arab world immediately. We can say, well, it has some impact on Iraq, how about Morocco, Jordan, yes. But it did not really adversely impact those countries to the point that it really created a major headache. To begin with, it started in Tunisia in uh, 20. For 25 days, Ibn Ali was forced to leave. And the reason that it was Yasmin Revolution, dubbed as Yasmin Revolution, uh, in large part because the army in Tunisia remained in the wings and decided not to shoot at the people. Actually, the army went to Ibn Ali in Tunisia and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to shoot at the protesters. And if you have a leader, that he is an autocrat sitting at the top and the army is not backing him up, what does it mean? He has to go. He has no other option. So Ben Ali was forced by his own army to step down. That was the situation in Tunisia. That's why Tunisia, despite all the problems that it has actually experienced, and some of them very difficult, that still remains to be the only hope that we see on this radar of the Arab Spring. Then we have the situation in Egypt. In Egypt, you have the army who has decided not to shoot at the people, but it has a different motivation. Its motivation is to get rid of the president's son because Gamal Mubarak, which is, who is the son of the, uh, uh, the Hosni Mubarak, is getting ready to kind of fill in the position of his dad because his dad is old, has been in power for 28, 30 something years. And the, the father is preparing the son to take over. And the son has a specialty in privatization. He wants to liberalize the economy. And in Egypt, the most important thing is that, unlike Tunisia, when the army was small and out of politics, in Egypt, army has been the major institution in politics since 1952. It's a long-standing institution. And, and one of the things that you have to know is that Egypt, in Egypt, army controlled and still does something in the vicinity of uh, more than one-third. I've seen figure up to like upwards of 40%. You have an army that, that, that controls 40% of the economy, all kitchen appliances. You go to uh, airport, all these aviation things, the bottled you know, water you drink, so all of this are the control of the military. An army actually controls 40%. And so the army says that to the United States, to the administration, that look, if you want us to push Mubarak to step down, we will on one condition, provided that the regime does not change. Provided that the regime change in Egypt does not mean that the army loses control of 40% of the economy. I think that compromise was reached with Washington. I don't have the evidence to actually support it. But from what I have read, I'm convinced that, well, the Americans said to uh, uh, Mubarak, you have to step down, and the army said, okay, we're going to actually facilitate that. But, you know, you want to be under, uh, in control. So what they did, they allow Muslim Brotherhood to come to power, and then actually create a situation for Muslim Brotherhood, and Muslim Brotherhood actually fell into the trap and all these things. Uh, and, of course, the uh, rise of ISIS and all these things. Back to the ISIS. Let me explain for you what the ISIS is, and then a little bit of explanation about the sources of their income is, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, 
Uh, ISIS basically acts and operates like a pseudo, some people say prototype state, sort of, I don't know, pseudo means fake, but prototype means like you know, semi-estate. But, but they act uh, as a state, and that's, that's the uh, major difference that differentiates them actually from the Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was operating from, a, from outside, the intention was not territory, the intention was to go after the external targets. But uh, ISIS controls, uh, mm, people say, great swaths of land in uh, northern Iraq and uh, northeastern <coughs> Uh, Syria, yeah, they control lands, but most of it is desert. Uh, I don't know whether, it, what would that mean, you know. But, uh, anyway, they, they, they operate like a state. And so I don't want you to feel like well, they controlled a, a good part of Iraq, they controlled a major part of Syria, and so they're operating. Some of the parts they're controlling are basically, uh, I mean, I think, they're exaggerated and the, the deserts, I don't know, deserts would for nothing. Uh, uh, they, uh, what makes them so dangerous is that they combine three things. Uh, the brain of ISIS, in terms of strategic planning, the people who strategize, the people who plan, are the former Ba'athist army. They are the people who were, at least know how to shoot a straight. Uh, they were the people who were military uh, uh, trained, you know, hardcore of military, the Baptists, which was half a million. After the Americans went there in 2003, they dismantled uh, the army overnight, without any replacement for that. So these are the people who have families, who are in the army, who are the top-notch police officers. They are the ones who actually provided the brain and the, for the strategy. But then you have the rank and file who are basically the ideological uh, jihadis. That is to say that they provide you with the manpower. Then you have a combination of the religious zeal and military experience add to that information communication technology, you've got a very, very dangerous mix of elements coming together. You have the former army officers who have training and a specialty. At least they have been in war of eight years, nine years with Iraq. They have a lot of on-the-ground experience. Number two, you give them, uh, you, you give them the uh, you know, strong jihadist mentality. And then you provide internet facilities so that they can promote their ideas. You're looking at a very dangerous uh, mixed factor. Uh, they have Apparently, nobody knows exactly how, you know, how many people belong to ISIS. I've seen figures from 30 to 35,000 uh, uh, members. Uh, they radicalized most of their uh, uh, communities through internet. Look at the number of the tweets a day that they are sending to uh, Syria. Uh, in a way, ISIS provides what, is what we call a sort of counter-trend to nationalist identities, because they're thinking about this virtual community called Ummah. And I say virtual community because we cannot have an Ummah if we have, look, we have 57 Muslim countries. In an organization called Islamic, uh, Islamic Organization of Co Cooperation or something, 57. If you include Palestine, 57. If you exclude Palestine, 56 countries. But there are different countries, they operate on different things, they have different national interests, they're all over the place. You have the largest, which is Indonesia, and then you have the smallest, which is Bahrain, you know. Uh, how, do, how can you create this Ummah? You cannot create it on this world. So, uh, but, but you can create it in the virtual Ummah. You can create it on, in, in, you know, internet. You can go on internet and say, we are moving towards the creation of Ummah, internationally, you know, to the Muslim community. And this is called virtual community, and people can actually, there's a universe out there you can talk, and you can identify, you can actually force some type of identities over the internet. But in, in, in reality, you cannot actually do that on the ground. So they use the internet, uh, and it's, it's something that actually uh, creates a notion of, uh, uh, questions uh, uh, nationalism. 
uh, they are the opposite of what we know since nation, the notion of nation state was created back in 1648. Uh, so therefore they question sovereignty, they do not recognize borders, uh, they do not believe in international law, and they do not actually agree on, on anything that modern nation states agree on. So they question everything. And the reason that they question everything, because they go back to pre sykes pico agreement of 1916, and they are visualizing that world, that community they have. Uh, the, the, the Arabian Peninsula uh, was not like Israel, Jordan, or Palestine, or Iraq, or the Arabian Peninsula was, was one peninsula. Different tribes, different groups, live in different parts of it. They communicated, they traded, especially they trade. There's a lot of trade in the uh, in Arabian Peninsula at the times that the uh, the Roman Empire is fighting the Iranian, the Persian Empire. There's fight between uh, you know the, the 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 West and East. Most of the trade is happening from south uh, from from south to north. That's where the Arabian Peninsula is. A lot of people in Yemen. They did trade with Damascus, but they have to go through Mecca and Medina, hence the significance of Mecca and Medina. Why? Because two major empires of the East and West, the Persian and the Roman empires, were at war. So there was this notion of community of the Arabian Peninsula. And I think ISIS wants to go back to that period. Uh, but there are two problems. One is the problem of methodology. How in the world you can create caliphate? There are people in Pakistan called Jama'at al-Islami. Uh, they claim that uh, caliphate uh, must be started from there. There are people in Palestine belonging to a, a party called uh, Hezbollah Tahrir. They claim that they could be heir apparent to caliphate. So methodologically, if you want to create a caliphate, you know, how do you go about creating it? Number two is the question of territoriality. Okay, so what are the parameters of this uh, uh, caliphate? And so it remains to be an ideology, but nobody talks about the practicality of that. What are the sources of income for ISIS? Uh, you'd be amazed that, uh, that how many countries in the world, uh, how many uh, uh, companies, countries in the world, are cooperating somehow uh, surreptitiously uh, and anonymously with this. I have a list of, uh, this, this is published by Conflict Armament Research. Conflict Armament Research, C-A-R, CAR. Uh, shows that 51 companies, 20 countries, have helped ISIS to develop uh, the so-called uh, IEDs. And there are many of these countries that have had a hand in helping ISIS to uh, develop improvised explosive devices. I have the list of the country, the list of the companies, and the list of the chemical precursors, the type of materials that go into this. And you'll be amazed. I have a letter, this is a document, a letter from a company in Turkey, uh, Gultas uh, Kimya. In this letter, uh, dated 2005, no, sorry, 2015, uh, 10, uh, 31st 10, so October 31st, 2015, the company is asking the member of ISIS, uh, can, can, can we make sure that these transactions between us and you uh, remains anonymous. They're begging, they're begging the, the, the documentation is here. Brazil, Turkey, Romania, Turkey, Turkey, these are the companies. China, Turkey, Russian Federation, Turkey, Turkey, Belgium, Netherlands, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Iraq, Iraq, and the disco zone. So you do have a lot of private sector companies that are actually selling stuff to ISIS. And so ISIS has become sort of a, a, a pseudo-state, 
but has ability to build its own improvised uh, explosive devices. Look, uh, they one of the things they do, they take people, you know, for you know, a ransom, uh, hostage taking, and they know which tribes is rich. They go after those tribes. Which European journalists are in the field, uh, and they go after them. And we have seen in the past, you know, French Germans are willing to pay them to get their uh, journalists back. Uh, they take as much as one million dollars uh, in a combination of oil sales, smuggling, ransom payments, and they sell oil in black market to men, you know, to countries like Turkey. It's amazing that Turkey buys, you know, uh, smuggled oil and gas from them, and and then at the same time, Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey, Turkey controls a large border with with Syria. Amazing, but when I read about ISIS, I cannot think, you know, what's going on, you know, why is it so many companies are involved in selling stuff to ISIS? And so that's, that's something that we need to be uh, mindful of. Uh, I, I want to actually look back to the question of uh, uh, identity, and then as we, uh, we have approximately nine minutes, we can actually wrap up things for you. One of the arguments that uh, Mark Lynch, Jesus George, uh, uh, not Georgetown, uh, George Washington University uh, argues, is that uh, we have seen the rise of these subnational groups or ISIS and all these groups, but at the end of the day, the states in the Middle East, like other states, they have learned how to adjust under the pressure. And if anything uh, else, you know, nationalism and nationalistic sentiments hardly are fading away, they are still uh, uh, surviving. Uh, of all the ism in the world that I know, socialism, capitalism, communism, this is nationalism. It's one ism that it just won't go away. And the uh, news of the prediction of its decline and demise are overstated. They still manage at the end of the day to survive. And one of the points that Professor uh, Mark Lynch makes is that you see this ostentatious display of the nationalistic flags during the Arab Spring. Egyptians use their own flag. You know, Jordanians are very proud of their flag. And look, Sykes Pico Agreement created this uh, unnatural artificial state. If you look at the map of Ottoman Empire, you, have, you don't have something called Iraq, you have Mosul in the north, you have Baghdad in the center, you have uh, Basra in the south, not to mention Kuwait. So what the British did actually by the, uh, the, the stroke of the red pen, they created the borders and they put this one, you know, Kurdish area, one uh, Sunni and then Shiites, they put them together and they said let's call this the country of Iraq and they got one of those people who helped them defeating one of the sons of Sharif, Faisal the sent Faisal from Syria to uh, Iraq to be the, the king who was there till he was overthrown in 1958. Uh, yes, we understand that. That Sykes people uh, created this artificial and unnatural countries. But a century has passed, and you know what? They have become the realities that we have to deal with them. It's, there's no worth in beating a dead horse. You know, this, these are states. You have to see them when they play soccer against. You have to watch when Bahrainis are playing soccer against uh, Saudis. Saudis are the big brother, Bahrainis are the little brother. And they, when they play, they don't like each other because they are this nationalistic sentiments that they, they have developed. You know, so uh, I don't know any, any Asian state on the face of the earth. Under most circumstances, I would, I would argue that states uh, are not going to actually let the part of their territory to be bisected or partitioned without a fight. This is not going to happen. Nationalist sentiments are very strong uh, among them. So basically, uh, uh, one of the points that uh, Lynch says is that uh, you see during the, 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 uh, the, the apex, the pinnacle of the Arab Springs, people are showing their flag. Uh, in the case of uh, Syria, and one looks at the case of Syria, you have to become convinced that this is the end of the 
Arab nationalism. Because you have Arab countries that are uh, pre you know, helping other Arab countries to break the state uh, apart. Um, Saudis are helping the opposition to uh, 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 Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Qataris are putting money in there. And on the, the, in the other Arab countries, like Kuwaitis, they're investing on the breakup of the Syria. But then again, you can, you can turn around and say, well, back in 1990, August 2nd, 1990, when Saddam invaded Kuwait, that was the beginning. That put the, the last nail in the coffin, the coffin of the Arab nationalism. So I think Arab nationalism, for all practical purposes and intents, is dead. And it cannot be resurrected. People write after the Arab Spring, this is the national identities of the Arabs. The Arab nationalism is making a comeback. I'm sorry to actually respectfully to disagree with that. Arab, Arab nationalism is dead. It's no longer there. So you can say, what about the Islamic identity and the, uh, the, the, the so-called is Islamic uh, uh, nationalism. Look, when I look at the, uh, the, the, the pan-Islamism, I really do not see any pan-Islamists. Take the case of uh, the coup in Egypt uh, in, uh, on uh, July 3rd, 2013. There was a coup, El Sisi actually moved Mohamed Morsi out of the power, and uh, El Sisi came to power, it was a coup d'etat, and immediately, Three countries of Saudi, United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait. They came together and they offer a an aid package worthy of hundreds, worthy of ten billion dollars to support the coup. And Qatar and uh, uh, Turkey were on the opposite side, supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. So pan-Islamism is no longer there. Uh, Pan-Arabism is dead. So, what do we have? We must have something that is holding some of these entities together. And that happens to be the nationalism within the state system. I don't have any other explanation for that. Uh, is the future of Middle East written in Syria? That is to say that we're going to see a Middle East for years to come, mired in conflict. I don't think so. There are some bright spots in Tunisia. There are some changes in Iran that are hardening. And Syria and Iraq, as, as, as you remember, I told you at the beginning of this presentation, that they have always had a tentative and tenuous relationship between nationalism and the state. And they were ripe for actually uh, breaking down. But I don't see that in the rest of the Middle East. I do not agree with people who make the argument that the future of Middle East is written in and, and uh, uh, in, in Syria, that the writing is on the wall and you should expect 30 years more. I'm not quite sure that would be the story of the Middle East. And I have some reasons to believe that that's not the case. Uh, I would argue that state borders will stay the same. Uh, and the alternative to a state system in the Middle East is far worse. But there would be changes within the borders. You're going to see more, you know, uh, autonomous region for the courts, there would be separations of uh, the Shia and, and Sunnis, there would be within the state some changes because of these Arab Springs, but not the state itself. The borders are not going to change. There are some bright spots in the Middle East worthy of attention. Uh, one is Iran. Is Iran ready to move into the near future, I think, into something which is different? Uh, I, I see that happening. But it's, it's going to be extremely, extremely slow process, you know, and it's, it's a very slow process, but it's an inevitable process, in large part because of the Iranian demographics. You have 69% of the population below the age 30. This is a young population. They no longer go to mosque. The Islamic... Uh, the, 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 is, you know, political Islam does not appeal to them. They are hooked up with the world, they are connected with it, they are wired up, they are all behind their laptops. And they know about, uh, you know, all of this, you know, theories of globalization, movements and all these things. They really are eager to engage with the rest of the world. They want to work uh, with the rest of the world. 
Yes, there was an excellent uh, uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times as I was coming to Lincoln, I was reading that. Well, the Iranians are more in line with kind of diplomatic engagement, uh, political engagement, economic engagement. But they're not in the business of civic empowerment and you know, democratic representation and human rights. Yes, that's true. But knowing what the region is, and I'm looking at Iran, and I'm looking at the pace with which Iran is moving, it's a very slow pace. But at least we have some elections. And elections in Iran happened on uh, February 26th. Not a single shot was fired. But there was elections and hardliners lost bad. They were human and human did it. And the, there is no reforms no longer in Iranian parliament. The, we have moderates. And, and moderates are the ones who would like to actually work towards the ending the nuclear deal and work with others and all these things. And so there is a little bit of hope there. That's the that's the. Good point. Let me just uh, move to uh, conclude uh, because we, uh, actually, uh, if I if, can, I have just one minute to wrap up things. Yes, um, uh, I think uh, nationalism in Middle East uh, is alive and well, and it's going to uh, is going to be the most important development, even in unnatural and artificial states. I think a state system will preserve. The alternative to a state system is absolutely unthinkable. Uh, look, in Lebanon, which experienced 15 years of civil war, the reason that Maronite Christians and Shia to Sunni Muslims, they agreed on a social contract to end the civil war was not that the agreement arose because of reconciliation and resolution of the problems, sectarian problems. It was they look at the alternative and they felt that alternative is unthinkable, is far worse and they cannot actually move along this one. Fragmentation will happen uh, some people say, well, Iraq should be partitioned. It's in the long-term interest of Syria to be partitioned. Fine. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's the best alternative. But if you ask me, I would say today's partition scenario, uh, they, they look even worse. So I don't see any alternatives. And lastly, the best way to fight uh, jihad, this jihadi, Wahhabism, Salafism, is that if we can find ways to uh, prevent the local extremism and local alienation. So the solutions should come from uh, the region, not from outside. Thank you so much. You have a great audience.